This is the second of three videos concerning problems with consumer surplus. In this video, as the title in the upper left says, I'm going to argue that consumer surplus is actually an incorrect measure of value. Think about this policy. The policy says, give the person whose demand curve is indicated in this graph, give this person four apples. We want to discuss what the value of this policy is. That is, what the, what the value of these four apples is to this consumer. Now, we already studied how to do that via consumer surplus. And so in this left-hand diagram, I'm going to show that the consumer surplus answer was you, you take the area under the demand curve, this, this yellow area, and that would be the answer to the question. You'd, you'd calculate that area, and that would be the value of four apples of this person. This other diagram is identical to the first. I might not have drawn it quite identical, but I intended to. And so the answer is the same. And, and the yellow triangle, uh, the yellow area, I guess it's without a trapezoid, the yellow area on the right is the same as the yellow area on the left. It's consumer surplus, and that would be the, the answer to the question that you've learned so far to what's the value of four apples to this person if let's just assume that this is the demand curve for apples. But now let me argue that that's actually not right. Go back to this, the way we derived consumer surplus in the first place. So on the left, we had an auctioneer. We said if, if he auctions off one apple, then the price will be P1 and the amount of money that changes hands is this rectangle. So that's the value to the consumer of, of the first apple. And then we said now the auctioneer announces that he's got a second apple available for sale. And we want to find out what the price in that second auction is. And what we did last time is we went up to the demand curve and we said that, that was the price of the second auction. And now I'm going to argue that that's wrong. And the reason is because after this first auction, this amount of money has left the pocket of the consumer. So the consumer's income is less than it was before. His consumption of apples is more, actually, but his, his income is less. Now, if apples are a normal good, and I'm going to assume in this video that apples are a normal good, then when your income goes up, you demand more of them. And here your income's gone down because you've, you, you've you paid all this money for, for the first apple. So when your income goes, if it's a normal good, when your income goes up, you demand more. Your demand curve goes up. So when your income goes down, your demand curve shifts down. So the demand curve is not going to stay at D. After the, the payment, as a result of the first auction, the demand curve is going to fall. Let's call that, I don't know, let's call that uh, D1. So that's after the first auction. And so when the second auction occurs, the market clearing price is going to be this price. According to the demand curve that's been shifted down. And so the amount of money that changes hands in the second auction is this. Well, there's going to be a third auction, but after the second auction, this amount of money has been lost by the consumer, and so his income has fallen. So the, the demand curve shifts down again after the second auction, call it D2. So the third auction, the market clearing price will be this, P3, and the amount of money that changes hands is this. And once that amount of money changes hands, then his demand curve shifts down again, let's say D3. And so the market clearing price of the fourth auction will be here at P4. And the amount of money that changes hands will be this. So the actual value 
of four apples isn't the consumer surplus area, which is given by the, the, the yellow line, but it's this. by this blue or teal line. And it, if I used a whole bunch of auctions, then basically it would follow what is known as a, in, uh, in graduate school is known as a Hicksian demand curve. Um, but the point is that it would give, it would give a, an area here that's less than consumer surplus. So this argues that consumer surplus is an overestimate of the value. Now, let me talk about this example a little bit more. Economists call this situation or this this measure the willingness to pay, or sometimes um, willingness and ability to pay. I actually think that willingness and ability to pay is is a better abbreviation. Okay, so I just added um, willingness and ability to pay. Abbreviation WTP is is uh, willingness to pay, and WATP is willingness and ability to pay. Now the standard one is willingness to pay, but I, I think willingness and ability to pay is more accurate because we're dealing with demand curves here, and demand curves, of course, reflect ability to pay. They uh, they reflect a person's income or a person's wealth. So this is called a the willingness and ability to pay measure of the value of four apples. In advanced courses, this would also be identified with something called a compensating variation, which is a value measure that starts by saying, if we adopt the policy. So remember, the policy is give this person four apples. So the compensating variation measure says, if we give this person four apples, basically, then what is the person willing to pay for the four apples. Now I'm going to turn to the second diagram, and this is a more complicated analysis, but it's about the same policy. It's about the policy of give this person four apples. However, this one asks a question that's called the equivalent variation question. What if we don't adopt the policy? What if we don't give this person four apples? Then how much money would they be willing to accept, or WTA, in compensation for us not giving them the four apples? So this is a different measure of value. It's willingness to accept if we don't give you four apples. But it's just as, just as valid and important a measure as the first one, which is the, the compensating variation if we if we do give you four apples. So let's let's work this out. Well, if we don't give the person the first apple, then we can just use the same kind of valuation as we did before, P1, for the amount of money the person would be willing to accept in compensation for not getting the first apple. But what about compensation for not getting the second apple? Well, when we compensated the person for not getting the first apple, we gave him money. That increases income. Supposing that apples are a normal good, when his income goes up, his demand for apples goes up. So as a result of compensating him for not getting the first apple, his demand curve shifts now. It's, it's here, maybe I'll call it, I don't know, DA. And so for, to compensate him for, his, for not getting the second apple, you wouldn't go to D, the old demand curve, you'd go to DA here. And that would be the compensation that you'd need to pay to compensate for not giving him the second apple. So suppose you do that. You pay him compensation for not giving him the second apple. Well, that means that his demand curve is going to go up. Again, let's say DB. So when it comes to paying him compensation for not getting the third apple, you're going to have to go up to his current demand curve, which is DB. It's not DA anymore, and it's not D anymore. It's DB. So the amount of money you have to pay him to compensate for not giving him this third apple goes according to DB. And when you pay him that compensation, 
then here let me sh let me shift this label a little bit when you pay him that compensation then his demand curve shifts again let's call it dc so when you have to comp when you when you want to compensate him for his fourth the fourth apple that he didn't get you'd have to go to dc over there and so so that is the amount of money that you have to I have to pay him for not giving him the fourth apple. So when you add up the amount of money that you have to give him for not giving him, not giving him the first or the second or the third or the fourth apple, what you get is this. And what you see now is that the, the blue or teal area is bigger than consumer surplus. In, in an advanced course, you would find out that with an infinite number of auctions, it would be the area underneath something called a Hicksian demand curve, but it's not the same Hicksian demand curve as the one for the left-hand graph. So we call this idea, again, the equivalent variation idea, if we don't adopt the policy. So again, this policy is give this person four apples. And if we don't adopt the policy, then the then the compensation that he would demand for not getting these four apples is given by this blue area, which is larger than consumer surplus. Now, this policy was a policy that helped the person. It's not always true that willingness to pay is the same as compensating variation and willingness to accept is the same as equivalent variation. It turns out that if the policy is something that hurts the person rather than helps the person, then willingness and ability to pay actually is equivalent variation and willingness to accept is actually compensating variation. I don't think that's particularly important. Uh, I just wanted you to realize that sometimes it switches. So this doesn't always go with this and this doesn't always go with this. It depends on whether the policy is a gain to the person or a loss to the person. The main point, though, is consumer surplus isn't right. The, we, we now have two measures of value, willingness and ability to pay on the left and willingness to accept on the right. The willingness and ability to pay on the left is smaller than consumer surplus, and the willingness to accept on the right is larger than consumer surplus. So consumer surplus isn't the right answer, but we have two right answers that are different from each other. One on the left, smaller than consumer surplus, one on the right, larger than consumer surplus. So the nature of value to a neoclassical economist is binary. Value is not a single number. Value is two numbers, one corresponding to willingness and ability to pay, and the other corresponding to willingness to accept. Now this makes value kind of complicated. Value isn't just one thing, value is two things simultaneously. Now you can ask, well, but is that really too bad? I mean, yes, it's complicated. Value is two things. Value is binary. It's not singular. How bad is that? I mean, in the real world, in, in practicality, is that going to cause problems or not? And when I say problems, what I mean is problems in using these methods of valuation, uh, willingness and ability to pay or willingness to accept, to make social decisions or to judge whether some situations are better or worse than others, like the which route for the highway, which route to pick for the highway, as we did in the previous video. So that's the, that's the topic that I'm going to address in the third and last video, which is just coming up, which is now that we understand that the correct neoclassical valuation method is binary, is that going to be a problem with making social decisions? And the answer is going to be sometimes it is going to be a problem. And we're going to discuss that by talking about this stuff over here, but we'll leave that for the next video.